<laughs> so uh, I would like to welcome you all in this afternoon session of uh, this training series that takes place uh, starting from today and uh, they're going to happen the next couple of weeks. Uh, I am uh, Electra Simici. I am from ITML and I uh, co-coordinate this uh, project uh, with uh, Maria Elena. Uh, while uh, Carmen, she comes from uh, the head organization, FIPCAR. Uh, in addition, um, as in this partnership, we are three uh, partners. Um, there is a th third uh, partner, the Hellenic Association of Political Scientists, uh, represented by Elkinos. Uh, and we would like uh, to welcome you uh, to to this session, thank you for uh, accepting the invitation. Uh, I would say a few words about the project, but firstly, I will give the floor to Carmen uh, from Flipkar to say her, to send her greetings. Hello, first of all, I want to welcome to all of you, and I'm very grateful that you are all here today. Um, well, my name is Carmen, as you can see, and I work at FIPGAR and I am managing the project with the rest of the partners and yeah, that's all. So welcome to all of you and I hope you, you enjoy it and you learn a lot of interesting things for yourself. Great, thank you. Uh, just uh, to let you know, um, I will say a few words about the project in order to better introduce you to this uh, series of uh, trainings. Uh, DEC stands from Digital and Environmental Citizenship. Uh, so uh, the project has to do with uh, this. Uh, and it tries to address uh, three main uh, horizontal priorities about uh, digital transformation. Uh, through development of digital readiness uh, in terms of uh, youth and uh, promote active citizenship uh, and enhance uh, young people's sense of initiative, uh, including social entrepreneurship, but this is not uh, our case here. Uh, it's more about citizenship. Uh, and also um, on environment and fight uh, against climate change. In addition, there are a couple of more topics that uh, the project addresses. It's about uh, democracy and inclusive democratic participation, as well as digital skills and uh, competencies. Uh, the major aim of uh, the uh, digital and environmental citizenship, the tech project, uh, is to provide uh, young people with basic skills attitudes and understanding in order to engage effectively and responsibly in a digital society. Uh, the action uh, is to um, uh, become fully aware of what does it mean to uh, be a digital citizen and uh, to take actions towards a, a safer environment. Uh, the idea uh, was initiated um, during the COVID uh, pandemic, uh, where our lives turn to be a little bit more digital. This means that, uh, for example, the meetings that they usually uh, took place with a physical presence, it turned to be digital. Uh, some uh, social media platforms uh, shown great uh, uh, increase in participation through the pandemic, as for example, TikTok. Uh, and especially young people, um, they started engaging more with social media uh, and through uh, providing their um, uh, life and their personal uh, space, let's say, through the media. Uh, so um, as uh, partners, we thought that this could be a good uh, uh, time to um, let young people especially, but people in general uh, understand about what does it mean to uh, participate somewhere online and what does it mean to have uh, e-presence 
and uh, what are the risk hazards or rights uh, and responsibilities of the reef uh, from this situation. Uh, as uh, the project itself, uh, it consists of uh, three major pillars. Uh, the first one is the current one um, that courses, uh, the series of courses about uh, social impact. They're called Online Youth Academy for Social Impact. Uh, the second uh, series of training, uh, and the first one is by ITML, uh, my, the company that I represent. Uh, the second one is uh, uh, contacting is being contacted by FIBGAR, uh, the online youth action for safer environment, and the final one, the intergenerational dialogues, uh, is by the Hellenic Association of Political Sciences. I, I will just go very briefly uh, through uh, these three activities and what they aim, and then I will give the floor to Marilena to start uh, her presentation uh, on this day's uh, course. So the first one, our current activity, uh, the Online Youth Academy for Social Impact, includes uh, the development of uh, an online program focused on youth key skills, attitudes, and competencies for democratic culture. Uh, it is divided in three sections. So you're gonna learn about what does it mean to being online, but also uh, well-being online and your online rights as a consumer. Uh, in addition, um, who, we might, um, uh, if we have the time, we might address also some aspects of digital activism and digital influencing. And these will might be uh, some spots here and there in, uh, uh, in these first training series. The second uh, course is about uh, the environment. Uh, and this uh, activity is divided in uh, some sections. I firstly is focused on the development of a course on climate change and human rights. So in the previous, uh, I forgot to mention that in the previous one, uh, in our current course, um, some uh, terms of um, uh, each persona, for example, will be analyzed uh, and uh, um, some other terms will be clear, like the digital citizenship part. Sorry, uh, I, I proceed with the second course. So the first part is on the climate change and human rights. Uh, the second um, part uh, would be about young people uh, and how uh, they can reach uh, on aspects of climate change and environmental citizenship. Um, this uh, part will be conducted through working in small groups uh, with the support of professionals. The third section will consist of uh, an online debate, again, with the participation of professionals in the area. And the last section, uh, young people will be assisted in the development, you, the participants, uh, will be assisted in the development and implementation of the digital action, uh, climate action. The third and final uh, part of this series of activities uh, is the inter intergenerational dialogues. And as an activity, it aims to engage people to participate in the policy making uh, area uh, in the of the environment and civic engagement and digital era. Uh, so the participants will be trained um, in order to develop uh, their action plans. So the first part will consist of uh, how to uh, create an action plan, uh, what is an, is an action plan and what should I achieve through drafting an action plan. And then uh, by using that, these action plans, um, a, a dialogue will be created between uh, competent institutions and relevant stakeholders uh, to the um, uh, uh, to the action plan developed on these uh, sections of environment, civic engagement, and digital era. Uh, if you want to find further information regarding the project, uh, you can either uh, reach uh, me uh, or uh, Magdalena or Carmen or Alkinos through the social media of the DEC project. Uh, or uh, through our uh, uh, 
company websites where you can uh, reach out to us uh, if you need any further. And of course, through our communication channels now, uh, Slack, <laughs> you can easily uh, reach out all of us because we are all connected there. Um, that's all from my side. If you need any further information, I am available or you can write it in chat. Uh, otherwise, I can proceed and uh, give the floor to Maria Elena. Uh, so to start uh, sharing her presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you girls very much for the introduction. Yes, Anna, would you like to ask us something? Okay. So, uh, hello everyone, we are <laughs> finally 50 people. Uh, it's very nice meeting you all, even uh, via Zoom. Um, for this uh, first session, I will be your trainer and I will show you my um, presentation. Unfortunately, we can't uh, have it on full screen. Uh, because I need to have my notes at the same time as well, and it doesn't work properly with a full screen. So, uh, of course, uh, anytime you have some question or you didn't understand something or, or you can't hear me, uh, feel free to interrupt me. That's not a problem. I can also see if you're raising hands, so feel free. Um, well, some uh, small introduction about me and um, the <laughs> our main trainer who couldn't make it today due to unexpected work overload, but uh, she helped me a lot with the presentation and the information. So I will um, introduce her as well. I'm Marilena Yanakopoulou. I represent ITML, uh, where I work as an HR and project management assistant. Um, I have graduated from a um, business management department of uh, Greek business school, university. Okay. Someone should mute, sorry. <laughs> Okay, and uh, I've been a former volunteer in various organizations and activities um, where I had to do trainings as well. Um, okay, it's not my <laughs> uh, best skill, but okay, still. So uh, I also had the, the help and support of my colleague, Thora Anastasiou. Um, she's like more familiar, I would say, um, mainly professionally with the digital world as uh, she's doing her master's in intelligent technologies, computing systems, and all those hot topics. And uh, she's working as a UX UI designer at ITML, uh, which means that uh, I'm just explaining because somebody might have never heard of the term UX UI designer. Uh, these people are the ones who um, make sure a web page or an application is user friendly. Uh, this can be the colors, the, the menus, the buttons, whatever. So we are at the start with our um, first session, first topic, access and inclusion online. So actually, what does it mean um, being online and having access online? Um, as we know, and as we see most people in the world, not all of the people have access online, um, the internet used to be um, 
a tool for professional and uh, academic uh, use mostly uh, back in the 90s, I would say. So it was used um, for very specific reasons and from uh, people who were either studying and they needed it for their studies or working and needed it for um, some aspects of their job. But right now, uh, what has happened and what we uh, all experience, and I think we would all agree with, is that um, mostly teenagers and well, young people in general, but teenagers and uh, even younger hmm, kids, we would say, of the age of 10 to 12, um, have taken over the internet and so we would say it has become a very important tool for everyone uh, a part of our lives no matter the age the background the profession uh, so it's quite mandatory for everyone to have access online, not only to use the social media and other uh, platforms that most of us um, use every day, but also for um, things that used to be done offline, like uh, some interaction with your local social services, um, most of us also use the internet banking, you know, all that stuff that um, you used to go somewhere to some shop, to some um, place and pay your bills or um, make a deposit or ask for some paperwork. No, you can do it online and sometimes you have to do it online. So let's move on. Um, so this uh, slide again is, uh, I would say it refers to, um, again, the activity one of the whole project as a whole, uh, because I will refer to uh, the skills that you need to be an active citizen and uh, interact, fully interact and safely interact uh, online uh, but they most of them will be um, seen in detail in the uh, next sessions by other trainers so uh, we have the information and data literacy um, well you all know it but sometimes we all know it but sometimes we uh, forget it or we ignore it, but we should be really careful of the information, first of all, that we share online in any digital platform and what kind of information is okay to share and it's safe to share and what kind of information it's, is not quite safe to share. Uh, but also the information that we receive, we should be are uh, quite critical uh, while receiving information, while uh, checking out information online. And we should, um, it depends. We should always uh, take some time, I would say, and uh, check multiple sources of information and not just trust uh, the first thing that we uh, see that comes to us most of the times. The communication and collaboration is also a very important part of us as active citizens because, uh, well, all of us use um, online platforms for communication. This might be the Instagram or the Messenger or the TikTok, Snapchat, whatever everyone is using for um more direct messages and everyday communication or this can be uh, the emails mm, the 
<laughs> Zoom, Skype, all those platforms that we're using every day and how we should organize them and how should we share and what we receive because, um, well, I, we will speak together about it later. I should say that in the morning session, we also refer to it a lot about the scam messages, the malware mails that we receive and how we should be quite um, careful and not so naive, um, unfortunately. Uh, well, the digital, the, the other three, I would say the digital content creation, the safety and the problem solving uh, do not always um, refer to us as everyday users. Um, I mean, all of us create digital content, but okay, we share it online uh, with our followers on Instagram or friends on Facebook, but there are quite many people who uh, create uh, content online and they share it with everyone. And that's when it comes to the cookies that you're hearing every day, you're accepting. Um, that's how the information that comes to you finds its path of coming to you because not everyone receives uh, the same information, sees the same ads and all that stuff. Uh, it's not something that we will do as everyday users. We won't create um, so broadly used in digital content, but we should be aware of what happens behind it. The safety, we all try to protect our devices. It's been quite, quite many years that we are hearing about antivirus um, softwares and all that stuff and other uh, tips to protect our devices. And regarding the safety, we have a whole uh, session about that. Um, which will be very detailed and very helpful for us everyday users. And the problem solving is literally something that um, concerns people who uh, are IT uh, professionals. Of course, if you don't understand something, I will say that again. <laughs> or if you need something, some extra information, can always raise your hand. So our goal again through these series of sessions is to, um, to, well, I would say broaden your horizons and then you will choose how far you want to go with each topic. Uh, because apart from the sessions, we uh, will share um videos or other links with you that might help you so uh, the main goal by gaining those digital skills that uh, we will plant the seed and then you will uh, choose whether you want to go further or not uh, our goal is to reach the digital literacy which has to do as we said with safety uh, which is the whole cybersecurity thing is uh, quite um, fundamental these days. The functional skills, as we said, how to use an email, uh, how to use some um, uh, applications that help you in your everyday life, how to use a computer, all that stuff. Uh, I think all the people here know the fun the fundamental things uh effective communication i would say that the, almost this whole session will be about communication and how does the internet change our way of communicating even uh, offline uh critical thinking and evaluation and about all the information we receive because there is 
tons of information online and we receive it every day. So let's begin. Well, this is one. Well, I hope this remains a joke that if it's not online, did it really happen? I think one of my friends once told me. Um, like, for example, you go on a trip to Rome for two days and uh, I don't know, in my opinion, you're having a great time so you don't feel the need to post something online. And then your friends ask you, how was it? Uh, show me pictures and uh, where did you go? What did you see? What did you eat? And you, you have nothing. So it's like it didn't happen. Uh, okay, this is way too much. Um, but we should say, and again, I think we will all agree that most people nowadays, especially young people, have, uh, have carry two personalities, uh, their real self, their offline personality, and their online persona. So it might uh, sound a little bit weird or even uh, terrifying talking about um, people having various personalities and all that stuff. But it's actually true, and it's not something bad. Um, I mean, think about it. Are you, each one of you, the same person online as in your everyday life? Most probably no. Uh, personally, I am not. And I wouldn't say that, well, my... Let's not talk about influencers right now, but um, I don't know me in, during my everyday life, I might talk about uh, or be interested about some topics that uh, I don't share with my online audience and vice versa. I share things with my online audience and friends that I wouldn't share it with my family, with my colleagues, with my friends offline, because uh, I don't know. <laughs> I feel a little bit different. It's the means. Yes, Joanna, please. Hello and uh, good afternoon. And thank you for presenting this uh, program to us. Uh, it is really important. I just uh, want to ask something you said before about cookies. And I know this is a problem. I currently work in an NGO that uh, speaks about digital rights. Um, I think the, the problem is that we have to agree in a very large um scripts that uh, many people cannot have the time or don't have the time or don't really have the time to read in order to just see something you have to agree or you will not have access in this uh, website mm -hmm. so what can we do about this like uh we, we talk, i mean i think you know what i mean by that yes yes of course um it's nice, and this question is really important. And uh, well, I can answer to you and tell you what I'm doing, and it doesn't take much time, of course. I don't take the time to read all the terms and everything. Um, but you can also keep that question for um, law specialists and cybersecurity engineers who are following. Uh, whose trainings are following. So uh, regarding the cookies, the cookies are just trackers. I mean, I remember that. I don't remember where I heard that, but they said that we call them cookies just to make it sound a little bit more uh, cute. <laughs> uh, it yes, like nice the crabs, like the crabs we leave behind. 
Yes, I mean, it would be nice if they said, uh, do you accept the trackers of your activity? <laughs> yes. So what the cookies does is that they track your activity on a website. What you can do and what I do most of the times and the websites, uh, the websites still work. Uh, if there is such a choice, you can reject all and the website still works. Uh, or you can um, open the settings. There's always such a, um, such a choice, such a button and you can- uh, In Google, you mean on the browser? Uh, not really. I mean, there are such ways to block the cookies on the browser and everything, but I'm not a specialist on that. So I won't, uh, I talk about it right now. And that's why I said why I said keep that question for the other trainers. But in its website, when the window opens, the pop-up for the cookies, you can um, it says accept all, and it will be the easiest pressing button. I mean, they always put it on the right the put a color anyways, because they want you to accept all. Um, it's easier for them to send uh, advertisements to you afterwards. But there are settings or um, accepting the necessary ones. In the settings, uh, most of the times, everything is turned off, is rejected. So you can save it like that. Or if it's not, you can um, swipe and reject the cookies. And you can continue like that, but still uh, you can reject them. Uh, most cookie, most of the times there are the necessary cookies, uh, the functional cookies, which will be, um, unfortunately, most of the times you have to accept them, but there are uh, cookies that are, refer to the marketing and promotion and all that stuff that most of the times you don't want to accept one last question and i will leave you alone to continue with your presentation i'm so sorry if i interrupt you uh, um, i just want to ask uh, do you believe that it's uh, better to browse through an anonymous browser uh in my opinion, yes. I mean, that's the only way that you don't receive any advertisements. The cookies do not exist and there is no history behind everything is uh, a tabula rasa. Um, it depends. I mean, for me, uh, those kinds of things is something that uh, it's better to be aware of. I mean, I am aware of the things that I accept, the tracking of my activity, and that's why I see advertisements, that's why I see um, uh, emails that try to promote me stuff. Uh, the only, um, not bad thing, but the worst thing that can happen to you via the cookies is not being aware of them and being afraid that um, somebody's hearing you talking or somebody's reading your minds because we have heard all that stuff. Yeah. <laughs> it's better to be aware of them. Uh, if, if, for example, I'm visiting a website that I'm not sure that it's safe, I prefer to do it on an anonymous window or a website um, that I don't want to receive um, advertisements from, or also that's <laughs> an extra tip, um, the airlines websites, because when they track your activity and they see that you're looking for some flights very often and you refresh, because you didn't have the time to book your ticket, um, most of the times the price goes uh, higher. But yeah.
Thank you very much. <laughs> That's how I uh, can help, but uh, please, if you uh, are going to be on, yeah, on the next sessions, you have the experts to ask, so feel free to ask again. And you're, you're never bothering us. <laughs> okay, so let's continue uh, with the personas that we were saying. Um, so, as I said, even me, I'm just a random user and not a quite active one, I would say. Uh, of the most uh, common online platforms and social media, especially. And even me, I'm not the same person. Uh, for example, also, if you want it that way, I have a friend, uh, I met her some years ago and she was studying um, communications. She had a profile on Instagram where she had 10,000 followers and she was uh, promoting stuff and she would even get good money to, to do that. She was what we call today an influencer. Just not by sharing her private uh, personal life as others do. And when I saw that profile and I didn't know her quite well. I was imagining of a um, very um, extrovert personality with many friends, many, I don't know, parties, many, um, a really outgoing person. And when I met her and got to know her better, I saw that she's a very shy person, a, an extreme introvert with a really small uh, social uh, network, um, which is actually quite good because it made me realize once again that what we see online is most of the times not fake, but we shouldn't assume that the other person is outgoing because they have 10,000 followers. Uh, this person specifically and other people like her is just doing a job. I mean, if I have a baker and I have 500 uh, clients each month, it doesn't mean that we are friends and, we, and that I am an outgoing person. It means that I'm doing my job and the more clients that I have, I guess the better the job I'm doing. So let's go to my favorite <laughs> and maybe most uh, challenging <laughs> um, part, which is about the communication. So uh, in this photo, you see Herbert Marshall. Marshall McLuhan. I don't know if someone has heard about him. I hadn't. Um, this is a slide made from Zora, I would say. Uh, he's, uh, he was, of course, a Canadian philosopher and communication theorist who said and supported that the medium is the message. The way we are uh, choosing to share a message is a message and not the message itself. Um, so, uh, just to not expand on his theory uh, much, just depending on the means that we use, the message we are trying to share is different. That's uh, the resume. So I want you to take a minute to think, and I would like to hear 
also some thoughts if somebody wants to share with us. Uh, imagine that you want to share a message with your local community. It can be any kind of message you can think of. Um, how different would it be if you chose to share it via video, via text, via audio, or via an image? I know the answer. Um, you can also tell me which one would you choose. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Where did you stop hearing me, please? <laughs> I think uh, before the question. Okay. Blocked. And now you can hear me uh, because my connection might be a little bit uh, poor. So I can turn off the camera. I don't know. Yes, we can hear you. <laughs> Good. Okay. Uh, so, what I was saying is for you to take a minute to think and raise your hands. It would be nice to share. Uh, imagine that you want to share a message with your local community. Um, it might be any kind of message you can think of. How different would it be if you share it via a video, via text, via audio, or via an image? If you didn't hear me again, let me know. I will use some. Uh, yes, Dimitra. Uh, hello from me too, a uh, beautiful presentation. Uh, from answering your question, I think that um, it, um, the different kind of um, uh, text, video, audio or image uh, kind of changes the interactions that people can have uh, with the context. I mean like uh, the text, uh, if it is a little bit uh, big, uh, they may not read it, uh, not uh, get through the end of it. So I would actually um, make an audio, uh, a podcast maybe, um, mm -hmm. or um, an image, I mean I would use it if I want to advertise something, or a small TikTok. So mostly things that have audio with me, or video or audio. <laughs> I was a little bit confused, but yes. <laughs> Great. Um, Dimitrios? Uh, greetings to you all. Uh, in my opinion, when it comes to participating in such, uh, uh, in actually communicating uh, not uh, in a lively manner, I, I dependingly also in the context of uh, and the purpose of uh, my message. I would most likely use either the video or the image since it, uh, when it comes to video, the video, uh, uh, we have basically a replica of live communication and uh, the image most definitely uh, adds more uh, legitimacy to the purpose of the text. Uh, so most definitely uh, video or image. I think that's what most people would uh, choose because nowadays most of the messages that we receive are not text and when I say messages I mean most information uh, that we receive is not via text 
Um, but in my opinion, yes, I, I do agree with you people. And I would also say that it depends to me uh, mostly on the crowd you want to share it with. Um, okay, we have, and I guess some of you have as well, we have started some marketing and we can't uh, let it go. If I want to share something with the global community, I can't choose a text because mm, I think I would choose the image because I would like uh, everyone to feel included whether they speak English or not. So I would try to uh, share my message, my thought, my whatever with an image. If I wanted to share something with my local community, since I come from a small community, actually, I mean, a small place, I don't come from Athens. So I could choose the video or the audio or even the text in some local website that I think most people would uh, read. It happens a lot. Okay, so let's move with uh, inclusivity. Uh, I guess that's a word you've been hearing a lot. Um, Mainly not when it comes to digital platforms and uh, social media and digital citizens and all that stuff. Uh, it mostly refers to active citizenship. Uh, but today, since our topic is uh, not going to be uh, racism and inclusivity and bullying and all that stuff, it's not why we're here. It's going to be about digital inclusion. Um, they are not quite different one from the other. I mean, the online and offline inclusivity. But let's start. Uh, so the digital environment that we live in uh, is nowadays our main source of information. And we are getting a lot of it, tons of information, as I will uh, <laughs> say multiple times. Uh, we are now more than ever aware of what happens in other cultures, countries, or even neighborhoods, because once, well, many years ago, uh, this was also not standardized. I mean, you wouldn't know what happens to the other neighborhood. Uh, okay, so that should make us feel like global citizens and try to make everyone feel included. But we will see what really happens. So um, just for me to show you uh, how important, how strong, let's say, uh, the internet has become. Let's refer to the example of, uh, see the tones again, Maza Amini. So some people might have heard of her, some people may have not. Um, the truth is that I had heard of her, seen her uh, photo online. I never took time to uh, read the story of what happened, but I would see this name going viral on the global news and um, 
groups of mainly women uh, going on strikes. Well, that's not the correct word, but I don't remember it right now. Uh, going on strikes all over the world and for, for this woman. So this woman was beaten to death by the Iranian police because she would not cover her head with the hijab. Okay, this kind of news was spread all over the world in no time, first of all, um, via all the memes, I mean, via videos, um, not only of her, and I don't know if there's a video of her, and uh, this uh, event, but videos, from other women talking about her and these types of um, police brutality um, via audio, I guess, and the radio and podcasts and wherever, via images, a lot of images, many, many images, and via text. Uh, I think there was at least one article on some website or wherever written in every country, in every language. So what I want to say and what I'm thinking of sometimes and every time I hear such types of news, I'm not here to talk about um, the social aspects of this, um, of these kinds of news uh, is that Police brutality, for example, here is not something new. Uh, this and other similar cases of police brutality, of femicide, of um, whatever you hear on the global news is not something new. It's um, just now that we have the means to learn about it and also react. because we also react through digital platforms because, uh, okay, there were many women, men, people, whatever, um, who went on the streets and they reacted and they um, did any uh, activistic form of reaction in the streets, but there were even more people who reacted online. And I guess there were, also influencers and public figures acting, reacting online about this. So what happened is that, um, and it does not seem weird that the Iranian government reacted with a total internet shutdown um, during those days so that the world wouldn't see the women in Iran reacting every day towards this uh, event. So that those women would have the support they needed from other communities. I don't know if you agree with that or not. Sorry. Yes, Joanna. I'm sorry. I, again, I am the one that speaks too much. Oh, I like it when someone speaks. I don't want to. <laughs> this to be a monologue. No, we last monologue. I I just want to just address the thing that this has two uh, sides of the story. We have fake news. We have um, we have uh, maybe someone comments something and rises. Um, a really fascist, uh, maybe, for example, uh, uh, organization or riots or something from something that they read that isn't true. Uh, we cannot verify um, the information if it's real or not. And uh, yes, we have uh, we have the advantage nowadays to react 
but uh, that comes with um, with some thing like um, I hear something from an influencer. I follow it like I'm. I don't have my own judgments. Not me personally, but I think uh, you understand what I mean. And uh, yeah, I just want to address that there's two sides of the story, and um, I don't know how to, how to overcome this. Like, what can we do about it? Well, first of all, um, I think it has happened to all of us that some at some point we read some fake news and we seem so uh, real that uh, we believe them, we got uh, influenced by them. I think it has happened to me, especially during COVID when um, I don't know what was the the main reason. I mean, it was because me, I was reading the news more um, often or it was just everyone going crazy over something nobody was familiar with, or maybe both. Um, what I would say and for sure is that we should try to have multiple sources of information and try to um, yes um, connect the one with the other and make sure that something that we read is um, true I mean this goes to to everything from um, a text message you might receive nowadays uh, to some global news that might be fake or local news. Um, so yeah, I think the multiple sources of information in order to make sure something is true uh, is the main thing you can do. And uh, I agree that to this also leads to, I don't know how to say it, to toxic behaviors from both sides. Um, yes, Dimitra. Um, I would like to comment on, on that, what you're saying, because uh, in the base of uh, verifying our sources, we actually have to rethink what digital activism actually is. Because in the Masamini case, uh, we are seeing uh, women globally cutting their hair. So you are a white woman, I mean, in Germany or Netherlands, and you're cutting your hair through internet. But these women in Iran are in danger, their lives are in danger every day. So uh, you have impacts, or why are you doing that? Why are you sharing that? How are you sharing that? And it's a lot more than just uploading a video. So, yeah. That's I do agree that, okay, sometimes we are um, globally reacting in some ways that could never help those women. I mean, me cutting my hair in Greece, how would that help these women? And I don't even know if they feel um, those, each person who chose to do that did it for um, to show their support, their moral support to uh, those women. I I'm not sure it's quite enough. Um, yeah, it's better to choose some other way, in my opinion. Okay, so... Oh, is that... Mm -hmm. So here, because what I wanted to say when it comes to digital inclusion, to the inclusivity, anyways, uh, I was saying in the beginning that we, through the internet, we are now uh, more familiar than ever with uh, other cultures, people from other countries, races, religions, 
communities and all that stuff. For example, um, let's say that me, I don't have any friends or family or whatever who belong in the LGBTQ plus community. Mm, but since this community is quite active online and they post uh, content and uh, they have the Pride Month in June and all that stuff, I have become more familiar with, uh, for example, a homosexual couple. And when I see one in the street or when I see the Pride Parade, um, it's not something foreign to me. Uh, this also goes to people of different races, people of um, different religions, and every um, person who has something different, I don't know, whatever could make them different, especially in, uh, in appearance, because everyone's different. <laughs> okay, so... I, I would say this uh, as a means of inclusivity, both online and offline. Uh, what we should uh, do? Um, this example with the LGBTQ plus community is something that should maybe lead to their inclusion in both the digital and uh, the offline real world. Um, in my opinion, this can be perceived in various ways uh, via the online content that we share and the way that we communicate. The communication is a big part of our lives and right now more than ever we uh, are trying to be I mean I say that as an HR professional as well um, we are trying to be more careful than ever um, while talking without discriminating and without referring to people with their gender for example and it's better to refer to them as they or them or whatever they need to um, be referred as and use the ad symbol instead of the masculine or feminine conclusion of the word of a word. Um, this might not make much sense in English, but it makes in both Greek and Spanish worth them. Um, uh, the adjectives have different conclusions. Um, so yeah, and I, I know that most of you, at least me, uh, I do think that sometimes uh, this whole thing about non-discrimination and uh, politically uh, correctness, <laughs> maybe, becomes a little bit toxic and too much. Um, but I think that it's quite new and in a few years, maybe, we will find our balance. So just a few things because, uh, well, I do want us to take a break, first of all. And secondly, um, it's just, um, I just want to refer to those words without explaining much in detail. But if you want extra details, first of all, you can ask me now, or you can ask the other trainers who will expand more on uh, the online rights and the cybersecurity and all that stuff as well. So what do you know about cyberbullying? Is there someone who would like to say something? about cyberbullying and what do you think uh, it is? Yes, Ioana. <laughs> I, I think uh, 
I speak uh, uh, in the point of view of everyone. I think it's really some. This is um, uh, out of the question, but I think some of us are shy, so that's why you see me <laughs> answering most of the questions. And as we progress, I believe that most of the people will participate. So um, I hope I don't uh, make everyone feel like I'm fito. <laughs> Or something. Um, yeah, of course. We, uh, uh, from my personal point of view, uh, I know what is cyberbullying. I've seen it. Uh, uh, if you scroll down, even in your uh, Facebook page, uh, your uh, your uh, you see posts about the news. Okay, you see uh, a news story about the shotgun from a police officer to uh, someone that is uh, from a different ethnicity okay here in Greece I don't know what happens in Spain because I think we have uh, people from Spain but here in Greece this is this happens a lot <laughs> unfortunately um, and we see the bullying coming uh, in the comments, uh, towards the family, towards the, the person that got shot, and uh, that's one part. Uh, that's one paradigm. I think there are a lot of others. Like, if you post a picture, and uh, I've seen some crazy one things like, "How are your nails like that? How are your eyes like that?" Like, they go to the details in order to, um, especially men i don't want to be um uh, i don't want to make it um referable to men uh, but i i just say that i think patriarchy uh always targets uh, the the women in uh, in order to make them feel um less powerful in uh, targeting on their beauty you cannot be a mother a right mother and have uh, beautiful dresses and uh, be a working mother you're not a good mother if you're working you're not and this happens a lot um so now I see Dimitris wants to talk so I'm stop talking right now <laughs> This isn't going to be a debate, but yes, I would agree that women are mostly, um, when it comes to such comments, because cyberbullying can be seen as messages uh, where the bull tries to insult or terrify the victim or uh, sharing the, the sharing of personal information, private information of someone else. Um, when it comes to comments like that, I would say that yes, uh, the women are mostly victims of such comments. Um, and it might have to do with patriarchy and other stuff, but I don't think that men um, are the ones who take the time mostly and to do those comments. So Dimitri, can you? <laughs> well, yes, unfortunately that is so. Uh, it's not here only here in Greece. It's, I believe it's a global problem and that's why it needs a global, a global uh, response. Uh, however, that being said, uh, I'd like to point out uh, the question, the another question, some another some other important uh, point that has to be made here. When does a political disagreement stops being a political disagreement or discussion and becomes bullying? Because uh, when it comes to situations that uh, you described uh, as well, uh, or a uh, hot political issues uh, of our everyday lives, for example, we see people arguing, and that is a healthy form of uh, exchanging uh, of, um, opinions, of course. Uh, but uh, this stops being healthy when uh, this um, discussion process, let's call it so, discussion process, starts becoming uh, offensive or intimidating or uses uh, personal notes in order to attack the uh, other side of the table, for example. Uh, and I believe that that's vital in uh, this discussion of uh, pinpointing uh, what is actual cyberbullying. 
when does political uh, disagreement stop being uh, one political disagreement? Well, regarding political disagreement specifically, um, I would uh, I would say what you pointed as well that um, and I don't know if we should call it a disagreement or a negotiation. It uh, should only and strictly refer to uh, political issues, whatever the issue is. Um, when it comes to a more uh, personal issues, or maybe it depends on what you mean on political uh, disagreement. <laughs> I imagine a debate of two politicians. So um, when it comes to personal issues, of course, uh, this becomes a form of um, bullying and it stops being a political disagreement or negotiation and it becomes personal. Like if we are having a political disagreement and we're talking about political issues, me and you, um, and then you start uh, accusing me of my personal uh, life of um, some of my family members, or I don't know what, it stops being a political disagreement. It becomes quite personal. Uh, but I also think that the political disagreement should also focus on um, some specific issues and not refer to the past or other issues or, you know, they have more uh, strict lines and a, more, a smaller box. They can be really broad. Yes, Ioana? Uh, I just want to clarify that uh, nowadays we have the right to, if someone attacks us on uh, uh, on the internet, we can make, we can uh, file uh, we can um, go yes. with, the, with the documents that uh, are referring to ourselves. We can the, show them. Uh, we can show them, even if the bullying is online. And that's something that uh, wasn't a thing um, back in the days. Yeah. And, yeah, but uh, I, regarding what uh, Dimitri said, uh, I I think we have to draw the line when um, we have a discussion about uh, some people. They think it's their right to talk about fascism because uh, they think that's that's their democracy right. Like I don't think that um, this is. Um, conversation this is not a political opinion this is something that you can that we should i don't know like i don't i don't know if you understand what i mean like but with we can talk about fascism for example in some a random Facebook post under in the comments. Yes, you, you cannot, uh, like uh, in Greece, you cannot just like um, uh, support Kassidiaris because it's like uh, he's a leader of a, a party that is really right, right wing and believes in uh, killing uh, other ethnicities. Like, so is that bullying? Uh, does that is this bullying to say to him like you don't have an opinion because you are referring to people like they're objects like they're not uh, are I don't know I don't know before Catherine speaks I will just uh, say that um Uh, to me, since we are living in a demo and we want to live in a democratic uh, country, uh, really and literally uh, everyone uh, should have the right to be heard. 
Uh, regarding these people, they're uh, insulting some fundamental human rights, but that doesn't mean that we should become like them and um, Um, cancel their rights to have an opinion when they have some opinion like that that people are equal to animals or to nothing and we can kill anyone and we are the kings of the world I don't know what um, we should go with the law and that's how uh, these people ended up in jail or wherever they ended up. Uh, Cancelling their human rights because they cancel human rights is an ongoing circle that will never stop. So that's why I don't um, agree with mm, somehow muting them. <laughs> so Catherine, what did you want to say? If you're still... If you still want to say something. So, uh, the last thing for inclusivity, and this is time for some vocabulary, okay. Uh, it's just a small difference and you might have seen those terms and I want you to be able to discriminate them. Uh, for example, the social uh, divide. Sorry, someone's right in the chat. Something's wrong with your microphone. Uh, oh, okay. You can unmute anytime. Don't worry, we'll just proceed with the next uh, slides and with a small break. And you can come back anytime. Catherine. So uh, the digital divide is a term that refers to the gap between demographics, demographics and regions that have access to modern information and communications technology, and those that don't or have restricted access. This technology can include the telephone, the television, the personal computers, and the internet connectivity. Uh, I would say that an example of that Mm, could be, for example, a traditional small uh, tribe of people in Africa who are not familiar with this kind of technologies. This could be an example. And digital exclusion uh, is not much different, but is where a section of the population have continuing unequal access and capacity to use information and communications technologies that are essential to fully participate in society. Let me think about it, if I should reverse the example. Mm. Okay. So people who uh, have unequal access and capacity to use um, the ICTs because of fear of using the internet, lack of uh, or insufficient skills. Okay. This could be, for example, old people. Like, <laughs> yeah, old ICTs. My grandma, for example, is. Uh... <laughs> using only the telephone and the television and that's too much for her. So, okay. If you want to ask anything else or expand on something more, you can let me know. I think we could have a five minute break and come back. And I promise we will, we will finish uh, on time. Okay, so you will okay. hear me again in three minutes. 
Oh. Okay. So I hope everyone's here. Let's continue. I will be way quicker, even though you won't believe me. So the learning and creativity, our second topic for today in general. So what does it mean, learning and creativity? Um, well, right now, uh, through our various platforms and social media, learning has become a lot easier. We have many ways to learn, and uh, I would say that anyone can even teach things. Uh, so this has become a, a lot easier and also more uh, accessible. Um, that could happen with a blog post on YouTube. Uh, sorry, Marilena, uh, can I interrupt? Could you please uh, reshare your screen? Because uh, we um, don't see uh, the PowerPoint. Sorry. Thank you. No, no worries. OK. <laughs> yeah, I said something is not going really well. Uh-huh. <laughs> Thank you, guys. <laughs> OK, so. Um, well, as I was saying, we have many ways to learn, um, and this could be a blog post, or I would say via text, which is um, the most traditional way. I mean, even when you read a book, it's just text. Uh, a YouTube or TikTok video and many more. We even have the chance to do some serious distance learning and get from certificates of attendance to even master uh, degrees. Um, so, okay, regarding the teaching, that's a way more informal, but just a few words. You don't have to be a professor, as you know, to teach um, something online. You can, any one of you can do a video and, uh, teach uh, some skill or some or share some information that uh, you think it's uh, would be quite helpful for others as well. Um, also regarding this whole process, uh, you can share uh, with the world some skill that you have teach but also share knowledge with other people who are interested in the same topic um, and you can learn from them they can learn from you and at some point you might have the, the content and the knowledge to do a full um, package let's say of trainings to other people and then uh, you might think that it does not make a big difference if um, I share some skill online, me, just a random user, not a professor, not anything. But if you at least influence one person, it's uh, already enough. So I... <laughs> Now I will have to uh, show you full screen. And I found, I mean, two videos. Uh, since I'm in the HR sector, I also chose these videos for that reason. And let's see, I, there is one in Spanish and one in Greek, just to make sure that Hopefully everyone understands because I didn't find something. Thank 
¿Qué no te gusta de tu empresa actual? Que no me gusta. Uf, pues mis compañeros. Mis compañeros son muy aburridos. Alejandro me cae fatal y encima estoy rodeado de todo el Aunque soy muy agradecido en la empresa actual, me han dado muchas oportunidades, la verdad es que me siento estancado. Creo que es el momento para dar el siguiente salto en mi carrera profesional. Ok. Let's see the Greek one. They both come from Randstad, which is a global firm of uh, HR consulting. to see those and I think you're hearing those from my microphone but still um, that's not an issue uh, since okay I just wanted to show you that with like approximately 40, 40 second uh, videos uh, you can still uh, learn something new I, I'm not saying that through these videos you gain the new skill, but both videos were quite important for every one of you, as at some point uh, you have done it or you will do it in the future or you are in this process right now, you will look for a job. So, uh, so in some way, not me, me indirectly uh, these people who did the videos taught you some skill via tiktok in just 40 seconds okay so let's see the the process let's say that you want to learn something some new skill some news whatever you are searching for it online in the best form possible. I mean, for example, uh, about how to uh, perform in an interview, I wouldn't choose to watch images or read a text. I would most probably choose to see a video. Um, Okay, then as we said, and as <laughs> Ioan's concern, uh, be critical, try to filter the information that you receive. Mm. Just first of all, with your critical thinking skills. <laughs> like if I tell you that uh, okay, go and in an interview and speak to the other person in singular and in an informal way. Of course, you have the the critical thinking, the filter to understand that that's not true. <laughs> this can't be true. Uh, but also you should search in various, because we're talking about more complex information, uh, even when it comes to learning sometimes, you can search in multiple sources and verify that what uh, you are learning is correct, uh, can be done, can be used in your life. And then you will easily gain some, gain some new skill or uh, learn some and something more theoretical. Okay. So I don't know if you have any questions 
uh, regarding the learning and the filtering, it's, I would say, a bit easier because um, when it comes to learning, first of all, you have some, I don't know what, what it is for everyone, but you have some trusted source, for example, uh, for digital skills courses, it might be Coursera or Udemy uh, that some of you might have used. And I would also say that uh, some trainings, some things that you might see online in order to learn something might not give you much, but from each small thing, you will gain at least something. Anyone from any uh, learning activity, from any text, any information you have to gain, you can gain something. So when it comes to creativity, uh, well, Albert Einstein once said that creativity is intelligence having fun. So uh, I would like someone to raise your hands and tell me what do you think being creative is? How would you explain it to someone? If I ask you what does creativity mean? to you and how do you believe it can help you become an active citizen how does this um connect to our uh, issue until someone raises their hand i will continue speaking <laughs> this has become a monologue okay um so Yes, Johanna, please. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I heard the desperate in your voice. Yes. <laughs> Desperation. <laughs> okay. Um, creativity, I think for me, is to think something out of the box. Uh, to be, well, when I think the word creativity, uh, the next thing that comes to my mind is art, is um, something new, something... Uh, Rhizospastic, something uh, really, really different from what we have used to. So to combine it with what we are doing here, uh, the environmental, um, uh, we are trying to protect the environment. I mean, <laughs> as active citizenships. Um, we can use uh, as you as you saw as uh, some small videos explaining about biodiversity and what uh, can we use some some small tips about uh, for example there's a toothpaste there's a toothbrush that is uh, from wood and you can uh, plant it and uh, make a whole uh, yeah, yeah they, there's a lot of tips you can do there's a lot of things you can do in order to um uh advise people uh about environmental issues and uh, internet of course and that's why we are here is the best way um i'm an environmentalist and that's why i uh, okay <laughs> uh, okay um so if someone else uh, wants to say anything Let's see. Well, regarding uh, my opinion, let's say I used to, to think that creativity also only refers to arts, but it doesn't. Uh, creativity is actually um, the capability that we have and everyone has, but some have developed it more or some others have developed it less uh, to take different things, much different things and connect them. As you said, the toothbrush that uh, is from 
wood and or bamboo and you bamboo. can plant it and blah 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 is two completely different things uh the wood and the planting and all that stuff and the toothbrush that we used to wash our teeth that somebody uh decided for some reason somehow to combine them that's a form of creativity and regarding thinking outside of the box uh, we don't have time right now but i will share it with you guys okay i will share the link with you it's a tedx page you should use that block <laughs> oh, don't turn to okay so that i won't take extra time from you right now and anyone who wants you can uh watch it uh so this uh man giovanni corazza corazza <laughs> um, was saying of how to get outside of the box because still in that seems something uh, more someone would think about it as a more chaotic and artistic um, Somebody will think that thinking outside of the box is an artistic and chaotic process, mm, but still we have somehow um, I'm forgetting my English is not something. We have uh, somehow um, mixed the word uh, creative with artistic and that shouldn't happen um so to get outside of the box there is a process uh, the resume of this video i would say is that the process is to cut what you want to to change into uh, different parts the example that he used was uh, a TEDx conference which consists of um, the TEDx team it's times different the speakers the venue and if you want to add it to the marketing campaign so uh, we take those parts and for each part we are trying to think of ways to make it different to make it more creative and to as you said in the video says uh, take it outside of the box for example how would it sound if a, a the venue was not a, a theater as it usually is but it was a, Mm, football stadium uh, during the, the break of a football match. During the break, which is, let's say, uh, 15 minutes, uh, there will be one TEDx talk. One speaker will take the microphone and do a TEDx talk. Uh, this sounds definitely creative. I don't know if it's really convenient, though. Um, but you take those parts, that's the main resume, and you play with them. You're trying to be more creative with them. You're trying to think of different ways of using them. Um, so the speakers, if someone wants to, to brainstorm with me and uh, become creative, feel free. Uh, the speakers, for example, if you've ever watched or been in a TEDx talk, come one by one on stage. They take approximately 12 to 15 minutes um, and they expand on an issue 
on the topic uh, from their own point of view. We can change that. We can play with that as well. There can be two speakers or uh, the, the speakers can switch speeches. Yes, Ioana? Or I thought about the uh, not out of the box idea. We could put stickers with QR codes around the city. Uh, well, that are biodegrade, that are uh, environmental friendly, and to uh, engage the curiosity of people uh, with a logo on it. And this QR can lead to a video or something that we want to pass. Sure as to share um yes i do agree that the qr code uh, always um i mean i love the qr codes because it's a really um convenient way to share something large with just one image that uh people with curiosity will scan actually yes dimitri dimitri <laughs> Uh, well, since uh, we are talking about uh, ideas worth spreading, uh, referring to TEDx and uh, referring to Anna, since we're talking about uh, environmental friendly actions and uh, actions to raise awareness concerning the environment that I too uh, uh, seek to protect uh, in my field of uh, in my research field. Um, another possible idea. Uh, that uh, uses the idea of uh, the QR codes is to link those QR codes instead of uh, various images to environmental actions that can be done locally, uh, like reforestation efforts or um, uh, beach cleaning efforts, uh, and thus raise the amount of volunteers engaged in those actions. I personally have done it uh, in the past, uh using this uh, method and it was actually pretty successful uh, when it comes to um gathering people that's true i guess there are many curious people who are scanning those codes i mean most of the times i do as well and yeah that's uh, that's nice i mean Nowadays, what we want is the information or whatever somebody is trying to share with us to be small, quick, convenient. The QR code is just about it. And what you share with the QR code should be as well. I mean, someone would sh might share a whole uh, academic paper. but I wouldn't read it. I'm sorry. I'm not a reading type of person. Uh, that's why I love this uh, learning topic as well, because it gives us the, the feel to feel included um, as that we don't like reading and we don't enjoy this traditional method of learning, but we can use the, the audio. I'm an audio person. Um, so we want the, the content be behind the QR codes be convenient as well. So, uh, if you can share, for example, multiple, I don't know, Facebook events, uh, a Google form where, where someone can, uh, sign up for environmental actions that you are organizing such type of things uh, catch the attention and also um, really enhance the active citizenship in each person younger or not uh, because uh, during this uh, time of information bombing we will um, not take uh, the time needed to search for um, the, the environmental actions that happen 
Oh, we're trying to find information and trust me, it's not really uh, easy uh, for me at least. So this uh, communion form of communication is uh, works for both you who are organizing the event and uh, you're trying to gather some group of people and uh, for the ones who are interested but don't have time to search don't know where to search and all this kind of stuff so i don't know if you have any questions right now regarding uh either the whole presentation that uh, we shared and i hope we enjoyed together uh, or about the program as well since uh I've been working with the tech program for quite a while. Yes, Joanna. So you to understand better the program, we are trying to combine digital skills like um, communication throughout the internet, but uh, create awareness of the internet uh, uh, with environmental protection. Something like uh, that. Well, um, I'm not sure. Maybe in the end, in activity three, they will be combined together. Right now, we are just doing the training sessions where uh, you can um, see some stuff. I mean, I don't think, and my goal today wasn't to teach you things. Uh, by the end of the sessions, you will have learned a lot of things. Uh, but my main goal was for you to start, you know, seeing things, uh, being more curious of searching things and, you know, do the, the process on your own as far as somebody wants. I mean, these sessions are more than enough for the program. Uh, yeah. Yes, Alexandros? Hey, good evening. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yeah, I, I liked your presentation. It was uh, it was very good. I have a question about the workshop at the, the end of the training program. Okay. Could you please tell us more about it? Mm, well, uh, I wish Altkinos was here, but uh, first of all, yes, I will tell you it will be uh, a two-hour workshop about policy briefing. As far as I know, um, because it's the third organization that uh, has taken over this action, um, you will be um, separated in groups and you will have uh, sessions with, let's say, policy makers and learn how to uh, build a policy, right? A policy. Um, I would actually uh, encourage you to, I don't know if you're on Slack, but you can join our Slack and you can find uh, Alkinos and ask him uh, directly because he will definitely give you the information you need. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, do you know if this will be online or in real life? Uh, this will be online, um, yeah, because we are both people from Greece and Spain in all the activities. Uh, the only thing that might happen uh, offline, as far as I know until now, uh, there might be some event hosted um, around May or June so that you and us can meet each other, but it will be both in Greece and in Spain, so. Mm. Okay, thank you very much, Elena. Yes, we, uh, if, well, if you have other questions, of course, I'm here. If somebody wants to leave, then uh, that was it from me. Uh, you will receive, if you haven't already received it, some calendar of the rest of the sessions for activity one. Um, 
with the trainers because each time uh, from ITML there will be a different trainer, different topics. Uh, so you will receive that uh, soon from Carmen. And here you can see uh, where, how you can keep in touch with us. You can contact us anytime if you have a question for, again, uh, the content or the program itself on our Gmail or our Slack. Uh, in the first mail you received, there was a link for Slack. It would be good uh, that you use it so that we can have more direct uh, connection. And my uh, work account, if you want to reach me for uh, these sessions, this session or anything else. Okay. Thank you, Marlena. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Electra, for being Looking forward for <laughs> the next Thursday for uh, the social media sculptures with yes. uh, Hronaki, Despina Hronaki, the professor from uh, the media communication department. See you all next Thursday. Thank you very much. See you. Bye-bye. Katerina, uh, the link is only opening a simple page on, in YouTube. Yes, the link I sent with the YouTube video is the one that I had in my previous uh, slide about thinking outside of the box in case someone wants to, to see it. Uh, the presentations and everything will be uh, shared with you. In the Google Classroom and the recording as well, you can have access to it anytime. I think. Um, hi, I am Katerina. Yes. Uh, I'm sorry, but uh, this link only opens an initial site uh, YouTube page. Um, I can't see any video. Ah, okay. Ah, sorry. Uh, Katerina, I just uh, told you that. I'm so sorry to interrupt. Uh, that it go, it's directly to the YouTube in my desktop at least, uh, and okay. I just so re resent you the. My problem. I resent you the um, the link, in order. Yeah, to... Yeah, I saw it. I clicked on it, and it's the same thing. It just oh, uh, opens a YouTube page, but. Uh, the initial page, not the... Okay, the okay. Uh, I will uh, copy-paste uh, the title so you can search it on the YouTube. Yes. Yes, please. Oh, Thank okay. you. No worries. I'm doing it for you guys. If anyone has the same problem, the title is here. <laughs> we did Thank you, Anna. <laughs> okay. So... Maria Elena, just I just want to say something. Like, everyone can live. I, I mean, uh, it's not about the topic, but something that you said earlier, and it is stuck in, on my throat. I don't know if someone here is from Spain or not, but um, but Hitler was elected from democracy, as far as we talked about uh, the other thing before. Mm. Yeah, okay. Hitler was definitely elected uh, in the beginning. It came out uh, some type of uh, history master, but as far as I know, he was elected, yes, with uh, the democratic uh, process and all that stuff. And uh, one of the first things uh, I think he would do uh, was to cancel the elections and it wouldn't happen uh, again yeah no but um that's why i meant uh with uh, the fascist groups anyway it uh, doesn't matter doesn't matter okay i just uh about democracy and how it's a really different topic well i just think that we shouldn't treat them the way they are treating people because it's something that we don't like and we don't want to support them. That's my in my point. Um, yeah, but but now we see France having a right wing um, president. Like 
we see Italy having the same thing too. Like mm-hmm. we we give space to these things, and I don't know history. Someone said uh, repeat itself only as a joke, but um, it's not a joke. I, I hope so. I hope so. I mean, I totally uh, believe. That. Yes, uh, like you can stop the recording, of course. Uh, thank you. Okay, I will stop the recording now. Thank you all. Yes, yes. So sorry. I'm so sorry. Okay, it's okay. It's just uh, it was just something that I. Yes, I agree. And well, if you don't learn from your history, you have to live it again. This goes to the people who vote for those. Uh, parties I mean uh, as you or anyone votes for a left party a right party or whatever a party uh, each person has a right to vote for any party they want it seems like many people vote for um, right wing kind of fascistic parties yeah so, the mm. yeah they know that's not cool that uh, they don't know